Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's my uh, pleasure uh, today to uh, introduce our um, speaker, Professor Russell Luke. Um, he he now full professor at the University of Göttingen in Germany, and he is a international expert um, of optimization and uh, var variational analysis. Uh, today he will talk about inconsistent uh, stochastic feasibility, the case of stochastic tomography. Russell, it's okay. your ball now. Thanks, man. Um, and uh, as I was saying uh, when we first joined the video conference, I feel more at home now in Australia than than just about any other place other than my own <laughs> my own home where I've been in lockdown. But I've spent an awful lot of time with you with you guys, and I've enjoyed the, the seminar, and I'm and I'm glad to be able to present in it. Um, so I I know that every this is also pretty nice for me because I I don't often get to um, speak to such a high concentration of experts in the area. And so, so this is kind of, of a high level talk and, and I'm hoping to convince you of, a, uh, of, a, of an approach uh, to modeling and thinking about uh, some of the things that we do uh, uh, on a regular basis um, that um, is, is, I don't know. It's, I think it's going to be a tough sell because the mechanics of it are a little difficult, but I think it's really the right way to think about how we do computing when we go from our theory where everything is perfect and we don't have errors or anything like that to actually putting algorithms on the computer. I think we have to go through these tools and I'll try to convince you of that in this talk. So. Um, but uh, first to convince you that this is not just uh, me um, um, making things complicated for the sake of being complicated. Um, I, was, I am motivated by a problem uh, from uh, x-ray physics and it comes to me from colleagues here in Göttingen. Um, and the situation is they, they have some, some molecule here like this. They, they shoot a, a high powered X-ray beam <clears throat> pulse at this molecule. The molecule is suspended in, in some uh, fluid droplet and it, and it comes down in a stream here. And then they just blast that stream with a high powered laser, one of these synchrotron lasers that are sort of the city size um, instruments. Uh, uh, the tracks for these are kilometers long. Uh, and and they, they blast the, the molecules, the, the, the energy of the, of the ray is, is high enough that it that actually destroys the molecule. But before the molecule um, explodes, you get a few scattering events from, uh, from the molecule and you record this on a just you know, regular CCD array, which you all have in your, in your iPhones or your, your you know, smartphones. And you get a bunch of pictures like this maybe. <clears throat> this is actually a very good Good quality picture. It's it's much more noisy in the experiments that uh, that my colleagues are working with. Um, these these are kind of typical typical images that you would get. And what these are, there's a model for going from here to these images. It's the Fourier transform. Um, but you have to take into account statistics now, counting statistics in this because what these photons are, these are these are counts of <clears throat> of a photon. Uh, hitting this spot. And um, the Fourier transform is kind of the average behavior that you would expect when you do this uh, for a fixed orientation lots and lots of times. And, and then the, the Fourier transform of the object is just the, the mean uh, expected uh, photon count that you would get from scattering from that molecule. Um, but the the extra um, difficulty here is that these molecules are suspended in a, in a liquid and they're at any odd orientation. You don't know that orientation and you cannot observe that orientation. So <clears throat> you get a bunch of images and uh, what these are are the, the Fourier transform. And now it's not just the Fourier transform, it's the Fourier transform of the magnitude. Or it's, I'm sorry, it's the magnitude of the Fourier transform of this object at each point in space. And now since we can rotate, there's a, there's a three dimensional um, uh, image uh, space over here. 
uh, where you collect these intensities. Um, and so you, you get a bunch of images like this. They're at a certain orientation. Then you have to sort all these images out, saying, oh, this, this image belongs to this orientation relative to these other images. And you have to kind of piece these all together. Once you piece these together, you get a three-dimensional uh, um, map of the Fourier intensities of this molecule. And then once you get that three-dimensional map, you solve a, a, a phase, um, uh, you've solved this nowhere in here, you solve a phase retrieval problem, which lots of people are studying and you can, um, uh, you can spend a lot of time just, just analyzing the phase retrieval problem, but that problem's more or less solved. Uh, that's not the bottleneck here. The bottleneck is, is orienting all these images relative to each other. Um, but you solve a phase retrieval problem and then you get back this, this image of the molecule. Um, and that you know tells then the physicists and uh, scientists further down the, the pipeline stuff that they can then use. Now, mathematically, we've got we want to find a we 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 imagine the molecule as what we're actually trying to recover are the electron densities, the density of the electrons in this molecule. That tells you about the structure. So the density of the electrons is a is a mapping from R3 to R plus density. You can only have non-negative values. Um, so that's the electron density. The electron, the, the measurement, what we get over here is modeled, or it's just, we use this notation for that. It's just some, some random variable indexed by another random variable that is selected from the sphere uh, the 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 three dimensional sphere. So that that would just that indexing tells you the the orientation if you knew it. And so the deterministic model for this really is you've got Fourier transform at some rotation, some orientation that you suppose you know. You apply that to the electron density, and then you take the this position. So it would be the that position of the pixel there take the magnitude squared of that, that is your measurement. At least that's our model for the measurement. And this is a measurement at, now this is an extra um, mapping here, this KS maps. In fact, we're mapping something on the plane, but actually what that is is a projection of what they call the Ewald sphere onto the plane. And that's all this, this thing uh, accounts for. Um, but so now we're trying to, there's a correspondence between this, this model for the measurement here and the actual measurement here. And the actual measurement is a random variable. Okay, so the, the, as I mentioned, the extra difficulty is that we don't know this orientation parameter S. So that's another parameter in the model. Um, it's unobservable. And so we have to figure out not only the electron density rho, but we have to figure out this parameter theta, which is the orientation of the, of the molecule. Um, right, so um, um, I like to think of this as a feasibility problem. As long as I find any, any configuration of all of these, these measurements that's consistent with this model, I'm happy. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. I set this up as sets. So I got the sets uh, C C of, of electron densities such that there exists an orientation that would fit the measurement. Okay, so I'm asking, I'm, I'm really not asking for very much. I just wanna find you know, some, some uh, density for which I take that density, if I rotate it in a certain way, I can explain the measurement. Okay, that's, so that's what these sets are. I can do this. This would be in what the physicists call the, the real domain or the physical domain, because it's, it's in terms of the electron densities. I can also express this in terms of what I would get in the measurement domain. Uh, so that would be the, these, um, <clears throat> what is this, a phi? <clears throat> so if I, that's a psi. Uh, psi is such that there exists an orientation now this would be an orientation of the Ewald sphere that explains the measurement there. So I can do these, have these sets in either domain, the, the, the physical domain or the image domain. And the goal is just here now to find some electron density that um, <clears throat> maximize the pro maximizes the probability of being in these sets 
when I then look over all of the uh, all of the index of, of these sets. So this is an uncountable set. This is just some some electron density that maximizes that uh, that probability. Or I can also look for these guys. This would be so pre phase retrieval. I could you know find the the size that that uh, maximize the probability of being in these sets. Okay. And the, the advantage of, of this <clears throat> modeling approach is that I can add prior information, which, which everybody likes to call Bayesian analysis and all of that. And it sounds really fancy, but all you're doing is just, if I know that this uh, is coming from a real valued object, I know that there have to be symmetries in this guy. So I can, I can put those symmetries uh, as, as extra constraints here and just add it to my feasibility model. But the, prop, the, the, the point here in this part stage of it is that um, I'm not solving a, a feasibility problem in the normal sense that we're used to. We're, um, this is all in terms of probabilities now. Okay, and the approach to this is, is by uh, random function iterations. Um, I'm gonna, I'll have a, a guess for my electron density. Well, okay, so this is first, let me just explain what a random function iteration is. Random function iteration is you start you have a random variable with some dis distribution mu, and you apply a, an operator to this, a randomly selected operator. So you've got some operator indexed by the Xs at iteration k. You apply that to the kth random variable, you get your next ran random variable, xk plus one, okay? And this random function iterations have been used to solve infinite dimensional operator equations, Butinari and Flum uh, really were pioneers in that in the, in the mid nineties. Um, distributed optimization for, for randomized uh, algorithms. You can, you can think of those uh, in this uh, framework. That's one thing I'm trying to convince people of. And this is, this is the central thing behind uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and Presidia Conus has written some very nice uh, articles on this. Um, but again, our, our tar target ab application in this random function framework we're, we're thinking now of the electron densities as random variables. We're applying some randomly uh, selected projector onto the CK set uh, to get our next estimate for, for the uh, electron density viewed as a random variable with some uh, distribution mu K. And this, so this is the projector. Um, but so now this this sounds all really fancy, but I want to I want to start with with an example that is from undergraduate um, numerical analysis. Solving ax equals b, okay, um, and in this example, uh, uh, let's see, we've got more unknowns. N is bigger than m, so it's an underdetermined system. There are lots of solutions to this equation, and. Um, uh, and I, it's, it's not part of the, the, the traditional curriculum for solving for, um, uh, you know, first semester numerical analysis in, in undergraduate. Um, but to think of this as a feasibility problem, which it is, because the, the points that satisfy this equation are just the intersection of the hyperplanes associated with each single equation that you have there in the system, right? So really, this is just finding this solving a feasibility problem. And when we think about it this way, we immediately think of our favorite algorithm, cyclic projections. So you can, there's a closed formula for projecting onto each of these hyperplanes. Um, and so you take each of the M hyperplanes, you line them up like this, you, you, you take the projector onto each of those hyperplanes. So you, you, you got your case estimate for the solution to this uh, problem. You project onto the Mth hyperplane and all the way down to the first hyperplane and you repeat. And there's a beautiful theory for this that's very old going back to von Neumann that if A is full, full rank, then cyclic projections converges either finitely or linearly to some point in the intersection from any starting point. Uh, and in fact, here it, it converges to the projection of the initial point onto the intersection. And then you give to your students uh, the assignment of coding this up. You've shown, you show them what the, the formula for the projector under this is, and you say, okay, we'll just you know, code it. And they do, and they get, and they come back to, to lecture the next time or eventually after the next, uh, after you've graded that homework set. And 
you, they show you graphs like this, right? You get beautiful linear looking convergence to about 10 to the minus 16, and then you get something like this. Would anybody like to venture a guess of what, what this is? Not a, not a difficult question. Why, why, why does it stop and then do this? Didn't I tell you that last time already? Did I, did I give this? Uh, they also have a deja vu here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you asked this question before. Good, yes. In, in, the, in the one world I th or somewhere, I've, I've given this talk, uh, I've given this talk, I'm, I'm honing this talk um, and uh, I've, I'm more focused here, but this is round off error, right? This is round off error, yes. right? We don't talk about that. But we get, but if you take, if you take uh, now you, you take successive iterates here and you histogram the distance between successive iterates around 10 to the minus 16, um, you'll, you'll see this kind of incidence of those distances. This is just the histogram of the distances between successive iterates, right? Okay. And so the other thing in optimization we do is we do summable errors. Uh, so we say, ah, all right, um, we've got we've got a, a closed form for the projector onto this, but we suppose that that we have uh, we make some computational error, so we just add that error here, and then you come up with a theory that if A has full rank, cyclic projections with vanishing errors converges, um, and so for those of you who've heard this talk before, this this vanishing errors argument is specious. Uh, because um, first of all, no one ever increases their their uh, computational accuracy from quadratic to power four to whatever. Um, they just stop at, at a certain uh, numerical accuracy. And second of all, if you have vanishing errors, that is tantamount to, to um, having uh, uh, infinite precision arithmetic because it, pre it presumes that you are able uh, to uh, get to infinite precision quickly enough. Vanishing errors means that the sum of this uh, goes to zero. So it's an L1. Uh, and and um, you, know, you can do some logic argument that basically says uh, that is really no different than assuming infinite precision from that first iteration. So we can't explain this behavior on the computer. Um, and just to say that this is the numerical precision and that's it isn't the end of the story because something is happening here. And my point is that uh, we, don't, we don't have a language for describing this. There's, there's nothing in the theory uh, up until now that could, could explain this observation. So now let's go into random function iterations. Uh, just explaining. So again, we're we're with our random function iteration. I want to transform that to a Markov chain, uh, and think of this as uh, iterative application of a Markov operator. But there, the underlying object is not um, the random variable itself that that we're um, observing, but rather the distribution behind that random variable. So. Uh, you've got a sequence of random variables. This is called a Markov chain with transition kernel P. Um, uh, if for all, for all iterates K, and these are all uh, subsets of the Borel sigma algebra, um, P almost surely, then we have that the probability of the next random variable being in this uh, subset conditioned on the previous uh, uh, random variables is exactly the same as the probability of this being in that subset only conditioned on the the uh, previous iterate. Okay, so that all that says is that um, the it, it only depends on uh, the last iterate. It doesn't depend on the the iterates before that. Um, and then also that the 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 probability of the k plus one. Uh, random variable being in this uh, subset conditioned on the kth random variable is, is given by this, this transition 
from the uh, the kth random variable uh, with this uh, with this um, subset as as input to this transition uh, kernel. Okay, so so then we can look at this this random function iteration as a time homogeneous Markov chain with transition kernel uh, p. Okay, and so all p does is it gives you with with this subset a it tells you the probability um, uh, given uh, these operators t um, uh, of of this thing being in that set a. Okay. So now the a Markov operator acting on a measure is is defined by this because you have this transition kernel. It's, these are probabilities. You have to you have to determine which which probability measure you're using, and in fact. So when you when you um, apply this to um, you can think of actually this being applied to the measure because you get a new random variable with a different uh, measure associated to that. So um, the sto oops the stochastic fixed point problem is the following: it's, it's a, given a Markov operator, find an invariant measure for that operator such that when I apply the Markov operator to this measure, I get that measure back. So we're just, just thinking of a fixed point of the Markov operator, okay? And this is different than finding a fixed point of, of this guy. These are different things. And that's, that's one of the main, uh, main points here. So, so again, um, uh, just to, Review some notation because uh, I'm going to give some some of the basic results that we have in this direction. Um, so we'll, our underlying model space, uh, our generating model space, will be a Hilbert space, and we've got compact subsets of this Hilbert space denoted by G. Uh, I is an index set indexing the uh, randomly selective, uh, randomly selected operators T i. T i is a self mapping on this compact subset of the Hilbert space. And it's continuous. Okay. Later, I'll, I'll um, strengthen the assumptions on this t, but for now, it's just continuous uh, for all of these indexes i. And then the and then the script p is the Markov operator associated with these these mappings t. So it's so it's the uh, and the the kernel of this Markov operator again is given by this the probability um, of uh, for this for this row, this is the application to the um, uh, single shot x-ray tomography. So the probability that um, our projector uh, applied to a given estimate for the, uh, for the uh, electron density is in a given subset A of our, of our Borel sigma algebra. So to these basic objects, which I've more or less already introduced, uh, I'm going to uh, very frequently use this this object here. So it's the the center of this is uh, this guy, which is what I call the transport discrepancy. Um, I don't know if that's the best name for it, but this is a term that shows up for those of you who are familiar with firm non-expansiveness. This this is a term that shows up in the definition of firm non-expansiveness, and it, it is basically just showing you the the discrepancy between the residuals evaluated at different points. Here evaluated at rho and here evaluated at eta. So, so in a Hilbert space setting, this, this takes this particularly nice form. We've expanded this to nonlinear um, spaces where it doesn't take this particular form. Um, but it's still, it has a geometric interpretation. But anyway, this is, so that's what this is. And so this, uh, this psi, uh, capital psi here is then the expectation. Now the, 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 the key here is that I'm, these are random variables and they each have their own distribution. So uh, the distribution for rho would be given by mu and the distribution for eta is pi. And when you've got different di distributions, there are different ways of coupling these distributions. And that's what the, the gamma here takes, takes account of. Gamma is in the, 
is in the set of optimal couplings between these two distributions. But then uh, there are lots of possible uh, uh, optimal couplings between these distributions, and we want the infimum over all the infimum uh, of this expectation over all optimal couplings between these uh, two distributions. And so that's what this inner infimum is about. It's the expectation of this transport discrepancy against uh, the optimal couplings between the distributions behind rho and eta here. And then, uh, and then we're doing another infimum over all of the distributions in the invariant measures of the Markov operator P. So lots of infimums going on here. In a deterministic setting, all of this kind of collapses to uh, just, just this, this thing. Um, but in the when we then uh, uh, pull this up to the to the uh, measure space setting, it gets it gets very complicated looking. Okay. Is it is it possible to yeah. give a brief comment like what yeah, the sure. what what the interpretation of this is? Because then maybe it's easier to understand this this monster. Yeah, um, the interpretation. So um, again. If, if we're in a deterministic setting and these are just points uh, and, and, the, and the distributions are just delta functions, okay, then the couplings um, collapse. You don't have to worry about the infimum out here. And suppose, let's, let's suppose that the invariant measure of this Markov operator is just a single, a single point. Um, so, so then all this is, is just, it's just this transport discrepancy, right? Um, and I'll show in a second where this comes up in the, and, and what's going to happen is this thing is going to be used to characterize the regularity of either, the, well, actually, this thing characterizes the regularity of the TIs. Because if each TI satisfies some inequality that involves this term, and I'll show you that inequality in a second, then we'll say that, that TI, those TIs are firmly non-expansive. With some constant alpha. But then, as you see, the, the, when we go up to the Markov operator, the Markov operator kind of kind of uh, embeds these, these TIs generate the Markov operator through this transition kernel. So then I've got all of these expectations uh, that then this is this is sort of the the measure analog to this guy. And what it, this does, this will, I will put conditions on this, the Markov operator that involve this guy. So this guy tells me about the regularity of this guy. Then when I use that to generate a Markov operator, this guy is gonna tell me about the regularity of the Markov operator. That's kind of how it's gonna Gonna work, and, uh, and again, so it comes. You, you lose a GM. Well, okay, this measure here is related to a Wasserstein metric. Um, uh, this one half here. This is. Uh, I'll I'll come to that the definition of that in a second. But but again, I think it's best to carry uh, intuition uh, from this basic object, which is something in a Hilbert space setting. Because T is this T is is in that setting, and and this monster is just kind of what happens when we when we go up to a Markov uh, up to the Markov operator from that basic generator. Okay, thanks. So that, then okay, but, but please, yeah, okay, I, I hope so. But I, I I'm since since some of you have already heard this, please interrupt. And I, I'm very happy if this is very um, a, a lot of back and forth in this discussion because I'm, I really do want to convince you that there there is some value in dealing with these monsters. It, it's it looks very intimidating, but I think it's I think it's a quite a powerful approach. So anyway, this is how it would look. You know, I'm applying this to my to my single shot X-ray tomography in, in this way, and so I'm just showing that all of these little abstract pieces. Uh, find their home within this application. So 
Now, a little bit more about this Wasserstein metric and, and the metrics in the, in the measure space. So we're, we'll, we, you would start from some initial probability measure. Uh, this is a probability measure defined on these subsets of the Hilbert space. Okay, and then these are distributions, distributions of the iterates of the random function iteration. So we, we apply the Markov hyperiterator. Actually, here I'm applying it on the on the on the right because that's actually the there's a you can also think of a Markov operator applied to a function, uh, and that would be called a primal uh, object or the primal mapping of the Markov operator. Here we're in fact looking at the dual. Um, space of the Markov operator. But anyway, so you, you apply the Markov operator k times to this initial distribution, you get a new distribution. This is the law of the kth a random variable rho k. And now we're, we're comparing distributions, so we need a distance. We need to be able to say this distribution is near this other distribution. Okay, so that's what all this is about here. I want to know how far away my kth distribution is to the invariant measures of the Markov operator. And so what this is, this is the distance in the Wasserstein 2 metric. And what that is in the distance, you know, now this is a set, the set of invariant measures. So it's the infimum over all in, uh, measures in the set of invariant measures of the Wasserstein, Wasserstein 2 metric um, that, that, that tells you how far away this measure is from that measure selected from the invariant measures of the, of the uh, Markov operator, okay? And here is the Wasserstein metric. It is the, so you can have a, the pth metric, so it's the distance uh, of these two objects. So now this distance is in the space uh, uh, of the where, the, where the random variables live. And those random, so this distance is actually in our Hilbert space setting to the pth power. Now, uh, over all the couplings, you know, those random variables have distributions uh, and the distributions are given uh, over all the couplings uh, between these, uh, these two distributions. Um, and, and to, sorry. Yeah. Yep, Can I also please. ask a question here? Uh, yeah. the, so these couplings seem to be um, ubiquitous here. And I'm very yeah. reminded of the concept of copulas, which are maybe more of a um, uh, univariate thing to couple, couple univariate random variables to multivariate ones. Um, is okay. this a very, very related concept? Um, I am out of my depth when it comes to the probability. Uh, this was joint work with uh, Anja Storm, the probabilist on this. I've not heard the term copula, but the couplings, this is, this is when you talk about optimal transport, mm -hmm. that's what all this is. If you've got two, you've got two distributions, it's the, it's the earth mover problem. You've got two distributions and you have to move this mass to that mass. That's, and, and how, how, uh, and how to move this mass to that mass. Uh, there are different, because it's, you can move pieces, you know, so let me, let me go to a. But, but the overall mass stays the same basically, right? That's the... uh, in this case, yeah, these are, these are probability distributions. So yeah, so the overall mass stays the same. Yeah, so, so the, the copula is maybe a similar uh, idea. You have two univariate random variables and you can combine them to, to a, a, a bivariate one in the, in the simplest scenario. And there, yes. there are many different ways how you can do, do that. And you can yes. break it down to, to um, distributions on the unit square, basically. And yeah, because you've got this issue, you've got, you've got the distributions then on the product space. You yeah, and, there, and there, there's a theorem, uh, I think it's called uh, Sklar's theorem, which basically says, this, this unit square problem uh, captures all the possible scenarios for all. Um, yes, and I think that's what these, that's what these couplings are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it's and, all and, the different and, scenarios. And their limitations on, on what couplings are possible and you can parameterize yes. yeah. families and so on and so forth. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So then, then yes, this, that, that is okay. what the couplings are. Good, Good. thank you. Um, okay, so um, with all these things in mind, I'll present the first result that we have, um, right, that we have from this. Uh, 
uh, and this is just convergence of alpha firmly non-expansive mappings. Now, uh, for those of you coming from the deterministic fixed point theory world, this is the analog, uh, the measure space analog to the statement in deterministic fixed point theory that if you have a firmly non-expansive operator, or you, 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 yeah, you have a firmly non-expansive operator and it possesses fixed points, then the fixed point iteration converges to one of those fixed points and uh, uh, converges weakly. And if you have compactness, if, uh, right, you need compactness then to get strong convergence. This is the analog to that statement. Um, so we start with alpha firmly non-expansive operators. Uh, I've got the definition to this down here. You can look at that while I give the statement. You've got a, a family of alpha firmly non-expansive operators indexed by I, it doesn't need to be countable, with constants bounded away from one. That means these constants, these alphas, they're, they're bounded away from one here. And this is that, remember, this is that transport discrepancy that I was talking about. If you, if you got rid of this term, forget this, and just look at this. All it's saying is your Lipschitz continuous with constant one. But then you've got this minus this term, so it's a little bit stronger than Lipschitz continuous. But the important thing here is it's not a contraction. Definitely not a contraction. Because this term could be zero, this transport con uh, discrepancy could be zero. And so then you're just left with Lipschitz continuity. And this is for all x and y here. So, so that's what alpha firm non-expansiveness with some constant alpha means. And that's, this, is where the, this is where the transport discrepancy comes in. Now, so, so we assume that all of these are alpha firmly non-expansive. And we also assume that, the, that there exist invariant measures for the Markov operator, which it, I, this is, you know, I mean, what that means in terms of existence of fixed points of, of these operators, we can, you could come up with something uh, uh, like that, but I'm only, I'm just jumping ahead to the existence of invariant measures. Then for any initial distribution, and the probability measures on Rn, the distributions of the iterates, of these iterates generated by the random function iteration converge in the pokhorov levy metric. Uh, I, I don't show exactly what this is. This is the measure theoretic analog to weak conver convergence in the weak topology. Uh, the pokhorov levy metric to an invariant probability measure for P. Uh, that's because I have Rn here, there's no compactness. Now, if I had a compact uh, set here, then I could get a stronger uh, convergence uh, with respect to the Wasserstein metric. Um, so examples uh, of this, uh, well, okay. I'm, you, can, you can actually put all the deterministic theory in, in this language. It's, it's not very uh, interesting because then the, um, all of this probability stuff just collapses to uh, delta functions here and then you're going to, to uh, various points. Um, but anyway, you, you can do that. <laughs> so <coughs> um, then a, a second result. So this is just about convergence to invariant measures generated by where the Markov operator is generated by these alpha firmly non-expansive mappings in Rn. Uh, another result that we have is, is explaining uh, how the regularity of the randomly selected mappings on the Hilbert space, in the Hilbert space setting, um, how those then uh, generate regularity of the Markov operator and then how we can put that together with this idea of metric subregularity, which some of you know very well, um, to get a quantitative uh, convergence result, linear geometric convergence, because this result is just about convergence, doesn't tell you how fast. This one would then tell you how fast in principle. So if to the assumptions of this theorem, so we've got each of these is alpha firmly non-expansive, now only in expectation. And uh, what that means is that the expectation of the distance between these two, now this is the distance in the Hilbert space setting, the distance between these two um, uh, points 
randomly uh, selected, and they're both um, randomly the same random variable for, for each of these. The expectation of that distance is less than the distance between the two points x and y minus now this is this is the transport discrepancy between x and y for that uh, randomly selected operator but then we're taking the expectation of this transport discrepancy over all of the possible random operators that we could have chosen uh, so this is again it looks very much like um, this same characterization of alpha firm non-expansiveness of these guys but just into a metric space setting um, and now if the again this monster that we looked at earlier if that monster is uh, metrically subregular with respect to the Wasserstein 2 metric four zero on the space of probability measures uh, on g uh, g is a subset of the uh, Hilbert space with constant kappa prime that's what this inequality is so the Markov operator or, or this, sorry, not the, this guy, the sort of the measure space uh, version of the transport discrepancy is metrically uh, satisfies this inequality. So the distance of this measure to the invariant uh, measures of the Markov operator with respect to the Wasserstein two metric is bounded by some constant times the, the value of the transport discrepancy evaluated at this measure mu. Um, another way to look at this is Lipschitz continuity of, if, if you could formulate an inverse of this guy, because that's, so the inverse of this guy is, is this. There's a zero hiding in there. The inverse of zero of this you know, uh, is in, in fact, the invariant measures of the Markov operator. Mm. So, this guy takes the value zero only at the um, invariant measures. So um, you can also interpret this as Lipschitz continuity of the inverse of this guy with constant kappa prime. <clears throat> so if you have these two properties, then for any initial uh, distribution uh, chosen from the uh, probability measures uh, P2 means uh, probability measures that are square integrable. The sequence <clears throat> uh, of measures converges R linearly to some uh, invariant measure. And this is an invariant measure that's you know, parametrized really by where you started. Uh, but with this rate, so the next iterate, the distance of the next iterate to the invariant measures uh, is less than or equal to some constant c times the distance of the previous iterate to the invariant measures, where this constant c, now this is where all of the constants alpha and kappa come in. So the c is given by this, just one minus this term, and that's, that's definitely less than one. Uh, and this kappa here is just some constant that's bigger than kappa prime. Certainly, if, if this holds for kappa prime, uh, it holds for all kappa greater than kappa prime. Uh, but, uh, and, and at least this is, this kappa has to be bigger than that to avoid um, negative numbers in this term. If the invariant measures consist of a single point, then convergence is Q linear or geometric that a lot of people understand. So some examples. <clears throat> you can, you can put all of this, this regular optimizations, operator splitting into this language. So here, my, my initial distribution would just be a delta function evaluated at the point that I chose. And if I've got some algorithm, Chase, you know, Douglas Rashford alternating prox forward backward, that's my algorithm, that's my T. So I have an index set of one, <laughs> not very an interesting index set. And I just apply that. Now these random variables aren't very interesting. They're just single points. This is, this is then deterministic. Um, so you can apply all this theory uh, to that and everything kind of collapses and becomes much simpler and you can get convergence statements and rates as well uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. So it's good because the, this more general setting captures everything that we know from the deterministic setting. That's, um, and again, everybody knows what a prox operator here is, so I don't need to explain that. Um, also, this, this uh, is particularly helpful. Um, I'm starting to now apply this to randomized algorithms. 
Um, so again, you, you imagine you've got, you want to minimize the sum of a bunch of functions. You got this is, a, and in machine learning, this is like a, a large sum of functions. And, and you put a, assumptions on these functions. I'm going to put ridiculously strong assumptions on these functions, just, just to show you that we can get results uh, in the ridiculously easy cases. Um, each of the functions is strongly convex with some uh, modulus of convexity mu i bounded uh, bounded below by some mu, and they have Lipschitz gradients. All of them have Lipschitz gradients, and the expectation of these guys has a minimum. These two, um, <clears throat> uh, and also, uh, okay, so assume these two assumptions. Our, our, our algorithm is going to be, you just take a random selection uh, of, of these functions, compute the gradient, and take a step uh, that is bounded above by these, the, const, the modulus of uh, strong convexity and the Lipschitz continuity uh, of the gradients uh, by this. So this could be a really small step size. Um, then given any initial guess, so let's take a delta function at some point, take some point, and you generate the random function sequence from this. Uh, the statement that you get th that is that as long as you take your step sizes like this, there exists an invariant measure for the Markov operator. Um, and the existence of the invariant measure actually works for, uh, um, happens for larger steps, step sizes up to one over L. Um, if your step size is small enough, um, oh, actually, no, th th this is a statement, then each of the, each of the, um, again, this is just a gradient step. Each of the gradient steps is actually alpha firmly non-expansive in expectation with an averaging constant given by this. And <clears throat> also we get that the Markov operator satisfies this, this inequality that was sort of the measure space analog to firm non-expansiveness. Um, so <clears throat> now uh, the statement that we can get is uh, for any uh, for any, we can also say that the Markov operator satisfies uh, this, this inequality. If in addition, this is the thing that we can't um, verify uh, in, very easily in general. If um, this monster that we um, defined earlier is metrically subregular, then convergence can be quantified. But we get convergence without this, um, uh, just from the previous assumptions, we just get convergence to uh, the invariant measure. And then if we have extra assumptions about metric subregularity, which by the way, come by this kardikyo loyosevich um, properties being uh, satisfied and other things. Um, so uh, so anyway, this is, I'm, I'm working out showing people how to use this for randomized algorithms, but I wanna close my talk with the application to systems of linear equations. So remember we, we had solve AX equals B, we've reformulated that as a uh, set intersection problem and cyclic projections with noise. Okay, so I can go quickly. And uh, where I left it uh, earlier was we, we couldn't explain this, but I claim now that with these tools, we can explain this. So, but you have to, and, and this also points out uh, something that is not obvious if you take the vanishing error approach. So let's suppose we don't have vanishing errors. Let's just suppose we're gonna, we're going to um, go, we're gonna go deterministically through these um, through these projectors, uh, but then each time we will make an error, okay? And uh, so that will be the jth random projection. So it'll just be the projection onto the jth uh, hyperplane plus some error, okay? And then our random operator would be like this. That's a natural approach. It would be the first one I would try. It was the first one we try tried. And we were surprised to find out that actually if you do this and you just make a, you just say, okay, the, the noise is isotropic, okay? Um, which you would expect, I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Um, then there doesn't exist an invariant measure to the Markov chain. So you have to be careful. Um, and the problem here is, is of thinking of the projections as exact projections with some noise. The, the, the key point is thinking 
that what the computer gives you is actually an exact projection onto a randomly varying hyperplane. And if you think about it that way, so think of it as exact projections onto randomly selective sets. So here, here, these are these randomly selected sets. You got some, so this, this A part of the matrix perturbed a little bit. So that's gonna change the, the slope of the matrix. The, the right-hand side, the B, that's just gonna change the shift, the shift of that plane, okay? So you got two different types of noise that can come in here. And your projector, this is the exact projector onto that randomly selected, randomly selected uh, hyperplane. So this is exact, okay? And uh, so we, we imagine that our computer gives us some number. Um, it's not the projection that we wanted to compute, uh, but it's the it's the exact projection that that the computer gave us onto some hyperplane there, and I do my and here is now my random, randomly selected uh, operator, just the 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 uh, composition of all of those projections. Okay, then this operator, the generating the the Markov operator uh, associated with this, that possesses a unique invariant measure. You can prove that. The surrogate function, this, this monster, you can prove that it's actually metrically subregular on the probability measures uh, on Rn, four zero with the constant kappa. So you can prove that the distributions converge, converge Q linearly and you give the, the rate exactly by this. So that would explain this, but what it doesn't tell you, this tells you, okay, yes, we can, we can sort this out. We say you are converging to uh, uh, an invariant measure to the Markov operator associated with this, but it doesn't tell you the, what that distribution looks like. It doesn't give you a formula for it. It's numerically generated and that's what this is. So what this says is, you know, and you know, I, I generated this histogram by taking like the last, I think 4,000 iterates. I took, what is this? Is that 100,000 or just 10,000? 10,000, um, the last 4,000 iterates, I got that. Um, that's, that's just what the, com the, the computer is now the distribution. And every time I query the computer, it's giving me this random variable. Each iterate there is just a random variable. So if I want to know what that distribution is, I can only kind of empirically, numerically compute the moments of this distribution um, if I wanted to fit that with some closed form formula, I could do that. But, but the point is that my computer is now the distribution. It is the limit. The state of the computer at the 10,000th iterate is, is the distribution. And then if I query the computer again, it's going to just give me another random variable. So, so I, I really do believe, and I hope I, I could convince you a little bit, that this, this tells now the whole, the, you know, it, at least it tells, it's a plausible explanation for what we observe here. You know, notice the, the variance is very small. This is in 10 to the minus 16. So it tells you, yeah, you can take the first 15 digits as kind of fixed things. And, um, but those still are random variables with some variance on the order of 10 to the minus 16. Um, and you can compute means, variance, third order. You can compute all the moments of the distribution behind those random variables. And then my next step is to then apply this to this uh, X-ray imaging um, uh, scenario. We've got data for this. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's a challenge that uh, scares me. Uh, but I think this is the right way to approach it. So I will end there. Um, the main uh, publications that this talk was based on, uh, first one that has appeared with, uh, this is with Neil Hammer, a former um, PhD student of mine and Anya Storm. Uh, we considered uh, the consistent stochastic feasibility case. So consistent stochastic feasibility is uh, in the case that, let me, go all the way up to the, the beginning, consistent stochastic feasibility is when the probability, um, wait a minute, um, sorry, um, here, 
when the 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 probability uh, of being what is it the probability of being uh, in any subset uh, for all of these is one. If that probability is less than one, then you've got an inconsistent feasibility problem, inconsistent um, stochastic feasibility problem. So that just so. So the consistent case, actually, you get much nicer convergence results for the consistent case. For the inconsistent case, we've submitted that almost a year ago now, waiting, uh, and that was quite involved. Uh, and then actually the, the approach that we took in both of these papers really came from this, this uh, paper that I did with Matt Tom and Tao Yun, uh, quantitative convergence analysis. There we could deal with non-convex mappings. These, we were just generating everything from convex mappings. And in this last paper, uh, we just showed the, the metric subregularity bit is what everybody complains about and, and it looks just awful and it's hard to verify. Uh, sometimes it's impossible to verify, but we showed in this paper that if if you have linear convergence of a method, um, metric subregularity has to hold. And so it's actually necessary for uh, linear convergence and you can do this more generally uh, with various sublinear measures and things like that. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Russell. Uh, so it was a nice talk. And now it's time for the question. Uh, any uh, question or comments, please unmute uh, yourself and ask to Russell. I have a I have another comment, if I may. Okay. Uh, thank you for the for the. Uh, Repeated talk. I, I think I, I benefited greatly from and understood more uh, the second time. So I, I and so I'm, and I'm sorry that, that you've you've heard this before, but actually this is exactly the community that, that I want to make sure. Uh, understand, I'm, also, understand I'm also very interested in, in the things you do for uh, various reasons, maybe that might, might become a, apparent in this comment. So there's this uh, concept um, of input to state stability, which for um, dynamical systems with inputs, or some people call them control systems, um, uh, where, the, where the input is treated as a disturbance. So for example, the numerical error that you make, uh, which is treated as, as an external uh, independent uh, input, not stochastic or anything. Um, this input to state stability basically um, uh, gives, gives you the property that everything, the, the state of the system converges uh, very nicely, uh, say to zero, you can always move move the um, uh, point of interest to zero. Um, if there is no error and it converges to some neighborhood, if the error is small and it basically scales in a continuous fashion, that, that is what this um, input to state stability property gives you. And uh, there are various characterizations uh, for that. And that would seem to be very compatible with the observation you made that um, if you have vanishing errors, that's also something that the input to state stability would capture. If the, if the input disturbance converges to zero, then also your state will converge to zero. So that's captured in this, in this property, which is basically an extension of a very um, uh, linear type stability property. If you look at a, a simple linear system, something of the form X plus is, uh, or the next X uh, value is something like A times X, A and some matrix plus uh, a matrix B times, times your input U, then a linear system with a stable A matrix, so spectral radius less than one would, would always have that, that type of property. Okay. And this input to state stability property extends this to, to nonlinear systems. And um, yeah, so in, in this case, I think this uh, would sort of fit the description, of course, uh, things are the, the, the whole, uh, domain where, you, where where your system lives is is a little yeah. different to to where um, people would normally consider these these systems and 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 for where the the theory is is uh, is, is maturely developed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I've I've tried to put some effort into to showing that uh, this this whole big complicated overhead of thinking of things in the probabilistic setting, it it collapses down to what we're familiar with from the deterministic setting, if, if you wanted to do that. So in, in a sense, um, it's, it's not like you have to, you know, shift to a completely different theory uh, to handle these more complicated uh, issues. Um, it's just that if, if you're in a, in a um, if you have the advantage of 
certain things um, vanishing or things like that, then you can avoid this overhead. Uh, some other point, but um, you know, I, I, one thing that I that I found compelling anyway in this in this analysis was, yes, with vanishing errors, you can still um, you can still get uh, quite far, um, like you like you mentioned, um, but. And I, I'm thinking now of a paper by Simeon Reich, where um, they talked about um, sort of randomly perturbed fixed point iterations <clears throat> that uh, they can show that that they they converge to these orbits, and the the size of the orbit kind of is is given by the the perturbations really, um, um, and how they set things up yeah that that would also suffice um, for what we're doing and and doesn't require the whole markov operator or anything really because they're 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 looking at it in the native space where the operators are working and all of that and all they say is all right i'm converging to some cloud some orbit that that has a certain size and that's fine but but here if you look at this example um that puts some of that into question because if you just randomly per perturb things there's always there's a non-zero probability that you can be arbitrarily far away <laughs> um, because mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that's what this example if if you model that perturbation sort of in an inconvenient way you can you can um, get forced into to uh, unsatisfactory conclusions it's so it's the difference between thinking of this additive noise type thing versus a, a more complicated looking noise model, but it's also equally acceptable for, for what we were doing with this system of linear equations. That's maybe the price you pay for using uh, probabilistic methods, I guess. Huh? I, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but in a sense, you know, I would want to go back and look at Reich's argument because just by doing additive error here, um, <clears throat> You know, this this is basically showing by they're not existing an in invariant measure for the Markov chain. That means that um, you could, with non-zero probability, um, mm -hmm. get a limit point that is anywhere. Yeah. So, so the uh, so the uh, in the context of this input to state stability uh, framework, what what you would have is um, that you converge to some set uh, that contains the original limit point, but yeah, you don't yeah. actually get precise knowledge to what exactly it is you converge within this set. So you just know it's yeah. some some neighborhood, some ball, mm -hmm. uh, maybe something more complicatedly uh, shaped yeah. than a ball. But uh, and and within that there might be a limit cycle, or it might just be a strange attractor or something. Uh, right. Yeah. All, all that all that is perfectly fine. But you get this type of continuity property, and at the at the end of the day, all these different approaches, I think, what they effectively give you is some sort of continuity property that if your disturbance is somewhat small, then uh, you, you you get you get close. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that um, has been the the largest technical issue in our work on this is is understanding how to work with continuity with respect to measures. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and that's, I, I was out of my depth for that, and that's why it was essential that we worked with uh, Anya Storm on this. Um, Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so any uh, other question or comment? I still have, have um trouble to understand this um, in its entirety but it's really good that you gave that talk again because I mean it was not exactly the same talk I mean um, and uh, it was good because I mean this this apparatus is a bit overwhelming um, yeah. so um, <clears throat> under, do I understand correctly that if you when you when you go to the x-ray setting then the randomness is basically the randomness of the orientation of these things yeah. which then kind of dictate randomly like what your next move of your algorithm uh, like like projection algorithm is going to be mm -hmm. yeah. and so you that's the analogy with the stochastic gradient you pick something at random and do your step hmm? mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is the randomness and what i don't understand really is how this psi encodes the regularity of 
something <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the Markov operator, right? <laughs> yeah, and the Markov operator in, in this example, what is the Markov operator? Is that the operator that tells you with what probability you end up in a new state after applying your alternating projection thing one more time, right? Is that this? Correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, that's that's the, the hardest thing about this is that um, the Markov operator is kind of always implicitly in the background. Um, so the Markov operator is defined by this. And you're right. So <clears throat> we've got a, a, a we're, we're at a particular um, measure and we've, the transition kernel is fixed. That's just set by these T operators in the, in the sort of native space where things are actually happening. Um, and, and then we're, we're sort of randomly selecting those T and computing, this is sort of an expectation over that measure uh, of, uh, right, um, for being in this set A. So that's, that is the Markov operator. Um, and it's, it's difficult to, to uh, it's always kind of implicit in, in things. Um, and I've, the, the, the biggest mistake I made in my first approach to all of this was, let me go down to this firm non-expansiveness. This is firm non-expansiveness in the, in the, just in Rn. It's very nice and you've got distances between points and everything's well-defined there. Um, the, the problem is charted trying to, you can't do a one-to-one -one analog between this kind of inequality this is a property on, of the operators T and, this, and the sort of analogous property of the Markov operator. You know, I mean, actually I had one to put P applied to some, the Markov operator applied to some measure, Markov operator applied to another measure here, less than or equal to the distance between the two measures minus this and then this transport discrepancy. The, I have to take couplings into account. I have to, and everything becomes um, really, really delicate. Um, and that's the, the uh, overwhelming part about uh, all of this. Is there a hope of understanding this psi in a particular application like yours? I mean, because there are so much stuff inside that, and, and right. especially understanding properties of that, and then right. the um, invariant measures enter the very expression of yeah. psi, and yeah. I guess that's what you would like to find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, and and this is this is again the whole uh, difficulty of working with metric subregularity. Alex comes; uh, he wouldn't call it metric subregularity. Uh, he, he he comes at this from from. Um, a much different uh, uh, perspective than I do looking at set feasibility and regularity of, of intersections. And you've got all these geometric uh, properties and, and you can move the sets in various ways. And so he, he approaches it from a, from a completely different uh, standpoint. And, this, and my characterization of this kind of regularity that we're after is, is I guess it's a, it's a metric kind of characterization of things. So th this is a, um, this is a, a really an unsettled area of what's the best way to go about things, what's the best way to think about it, um, and this is just the the approach I've I've taken, and and now my work is is set up is just I need to prove that you can use this or that it you know, somehow in various uh, settings simplifies quite a bit, um, but also in the process of doing this. When I first started this work with Tau, it wasn't clear to me that there was any connection between firm non-expansiveness defined by this inequality and the, the metric subregularity that we needed. Um, but in the process of doing this work in the measure spaces, um, it was the same object that needed to be uh, metrically subregular that came into the um, firm non-expansiveness definition. Um, 
so so that was the link between these two two assumptions uh, up until recently up until 2019 or something i'd seen these as kind of two separate assumptions for non-expansiveness and metrics of regularity um, but now i i think they're they're both uh entwined um in this manner but uh you're not alone in feeling like this is all really daunting uh and really my my task is to figure out the the simple packaging of this stuff and to give this talk again and again and again <laughs> until i convince myself maybe maybe not everybody else but convince myself that yeah actually all this uh, does make sense it, it becomes true when you say it often enough right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. So hopefully you indeed convinced yourself <laughs> good things. Uh, and uh, you, you, you mentioned two different approaches. I wouldn't say that they are different. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of you, uh, choosing the right convenient language. And this language yeah. it, uh, looks convenient. It can be applied to collections of sets, but it can also be applied to monsters. <laughs> you are using uh, for your research. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it looks like we are already far oh, up. <laughs> Ming is back. Okay. I thought uh, <laughs> I would take over. Ming. Um, so, sorry, my computer got uh, <laughs> turned off. <laughs> so, uh, uh, your computer actually had objections against claims made by Russell. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, we, uh, because I'm uh, out of the, the power, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, if we uh, don't have any uh, other question or comment, then uh, we uh, finish the, the uh, seminar today. Uh, Alec, uh, can you uh, turn off the recording? Oh, I will try.